Welcome to State of Tech, Synecron's innovation podcast. Synecron is a leading global digital transformation consulting firm focused on financial services and big technology organizations. Our State of Tech podcast hosts subject matter experts and business leaders as they explore emerging technologies, industry insights, innovation trends, and more. Let's dive into today's episode. Hi, I'm Melanie Benu, and I'll be your host for today's episode of State of Tech. I'm joined by Chris Zanelli, the head of IT risk and security within Synecron's consulting division. We'll be continuing the conversation about our recently launched risktech.ai accelerators program, this time diving into IT sustainability and cybersecurity. Um, risktech.ai aims to enable financial services firms to stay attuned and mitigate modern and emerging business risks, such as ensuring an organization's IT sustainability and flagging cybersecurity risks. This is particularly important through the use of AI and generative AI integrated tools. All right. Thanks, Mel. Thanks for having me today. Thank you for sitting with us. So just to dive in, please tell everybody why risk is such a vital element in today's IT sustainability landscape, as well as cybersecurity, especially since Synecron deals with banks, financial services, and insurance firms. Those examples would be great. Absolutely. Um, You know, uh, to be honest, you don't really have to go very far or look very deep into why cybersecurity and IT risk has been more of a conversation from the board level down. If you look at current events um, and if you look at the fast pace of vulnerabilities that are affecting the markets and not just the financial industry, but across public and private sectors as well, you'll see that there's been a a continuous and steady stream of exploits and activity by cyber criminal organizations. Yikes. Um, Yes. (laughs) Just this week, we've seen a lot of activity from Citrix Bleed and other longstanding issues that are now being attributed to one of the world's largest asset lenders, the ICBC in China. So it's certainly an environment these days where people are starting to become more conscious of the risks out there and the drivers of those risks. And I would certainly say that everything from geopolitical instability and state-supported crime has been a factor. Certainly, the technology supply chain has been dramatically focused on as a vector of attack and weaponization, in addition to traditional types of attacks that focus on credential theft and identity theft. You see that organizations themselves are becoming and embracing more digitally enhanced ways of working. Remote work has become more prevalent. The combination of personal and professional devices is more commonly accepted. And the adoption of public cloud, which really provides another layer of complexity and another perimeter for organizations to have to protect. So certainly to harness a lot of these accelerated business models and rapid ways of deploying infrastructure, it's a double-edged sword, right? You can gain from the benefit of that infrastructure and the value of of cloud-enabled technologies and vendors and SaaS providers, but you've introduced now more um, control plane points that you need to protect and more potential ways to be exploited. So cybersecurity is more than just a phishing email. (laughs) <laughs> is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. I mean, that's the traditional yes. way that we think about it. So, besides <laughs> phishing, um, besides spam emails, what else should we be on the lookout for? Right. So, as I mentioned before, um, software supply chain is becoming really prevalent as a vector of attack for organizations. And and we see now, obviously, the world has gotten to a place where its maturity is getting a little bit better about notifying clients about potential software breaches or exploitable software. But, you know, there's always the concept of these zero-day vulnerabilities that we find out more or less the same time attackers have found out an exploit. And given, you know, modern development and use of modern software tools really relies on being fueled by third-party software and open-source software. So, 
you know, the world that we live in has changed dramatically where a financial institution or, or any entity might have been developing 90% of their code. Today, those numbers are significantly different where they might be leveraging open source for up to 60, 70, maybe even 80% of their code and libraries that they rely on. So I think software supply chain, in addition, unfortunately, we will never see the emails from Nigeria stopping. Yeah. Um, they've certainly gotten better at targeting folks with spam and other types of emails aimed at confusing and tricking or fatiguing people into clicking through on them. Right. That will not stop. But in addition, software supply chain is, is certainly a rising factor in how initial exploits are happening. That's a good tip for everyone, um, something really important for everybody to understand specifically in this landscape. So the modern strategies financial services organizations can deploy are vast and varied then. Um, you mentioned all of the risks, but what are the ways of preventing those risks? What are some roadblocks that financial institutions, these big banks that we work with can implement themselves? Yes. So I mean, when you think about how organizations evolve a, a mature security posture, they really focused on the key foundational elements of identify, detect, protect, respond, and recover. It's something that the NIST 853 talks about quite a bit. And when you think about it, that expansive defense in depth across each one of those vectors is really important for firms to mature and grow within their organizations. I'd say, obviously, if you stepped back about five, seven years ago, a lot of the focus was on building those capabilities and identify, detect, and protect. They were certainly crucial to the avoidance of initial or the rapid discovery of initial exploits. But, you know, as we all know that it's not enough and as environments or organizations seek to mature their security posture around their environments, they realize that, you know, the inevitability of an attack is a high probability occurrence now. So it's also about response and recovery. How do we shorten the response time? How do we ensure that we can recover from a ransomware attack without having to pay a criminal entity to restore our data? Because we all know that they're generally going to attack multiple times and exploit you multiple times and even extort their ransom multiple times for a single event. We're not exactly dealing with an honorable entity here. Right. So um, in in order to do that, all of those things really require digitization of governance um, to, to bring up the bar across the organization. And I think that the key elements of digital governance are going to be around data-driven assessments. So across all of those domains of risk, whether it be vulnerabilities, end of life, security posture, identity management, malware, security events, all of these things need to be coalesced into a singular platform with a control plane that allows risk and governance professionals to really be reacting to the data um, and reacting to the events of these vulnerabilities and exposures and contextualizing them. So for example, if your primary business is in asset lending or if it's in credit and debit cards, you're also going to have middle office and back office systems that may not be an initial attack point for these exploits, but are downstream systems and still need to be considered along the attack vector and how infiltration is done in an organization. So getting to contextualize the risks with the environment and the criticality of those line of business applications so that you can make intelligent decisions on how to proactively address or remediate vulnerabilities. Because you cannot, you know, prevent yourself from all risk, there's really never a world where you get to zero risk. You're always going to be dealing with risks coming in of different types and shapes and at different parts of the organization. It's really about prioritization and prioritizing the largest pools of, of risk are that are known to be exploitable and focusing on cleaning up those areas and remediation in those areas before moving down to lower risk and lower probability assets. Right. And because everything in these institutions are so interconnected, that means that just one thing doesn't only affect or isolate that one thing. It will end up affecting multiple things as a result. So now with Risk Tech.ai Accelerator at Synecron, 
what are ways that AI and the future of tech can help with these types of solutions? Mm -hmm. And specifically, how does our accelerator help to address some of those things that you previously had touched upon? That's a great point. I think AI is set to have a massive impact in this space. And we kind of look at short-term and long-term areas where we think AI and generative AI techniques are going to play a very increasingly large role. I'd say in the near term, AI has demonstrated to be a great tool to augment traditional analytics with respect to discovery and correlation prediction and inference models that help us draw conclusions or optionality paths as the line of vulnerability or exposure becomes prevalent or noticed or identified. Sure. Um, we use AI to help assist a lot of the human-oriented risk management systems. So as I mentioned before, the concept of doing digital governance relies on really moving from manual assessment to analytic-based assessment, data-driven risk assessment, as opposed to asking people to self-identify risks or asking them questions about non-compliance. It moves that into a data analytics and discovery piece where we look at data, we evaluate how well adopted a control is, how well it's working, what kind of, if it's a scanning tool, what kind of exposures are being picked up by the scanning tool, and then applying it in the context of the line of business application, right? And that gives us an idea about, you know, how we should treat it or how critical it is. Is it a line of business that's affecting payment or payment processing? If it's a line of business or a data system that's managing confidential or customer PII data, we certainly know that we have to have a stronger perimeter around those assets. So AI can help eliminate or offset some of the manual analytics and relationships that we have to draw between data, assets, applications, line of business, and data. AI can certainly help in the way that we've used it in our accelerator, have helped proactively do some of that mapping and association for us. And human-aided analytics can clean it up and get it to 100% accuracy. But where I really am interested in the long-term benefits of generative AI is really how we harness it to do something that inherently it does very well. And that's scenario-based and human conversational level interfaces. So where I envision and where I'd like to take future stages of our accelerator are really building the ability to respond to human query, which might be posing scenarios, right? AI is very good or generative AI is very good at building a scenario where you give it context. You prompt the system with a scenario. So for example, Let's say we've just heard about Citrix Bleed and we've been kind of moving on in a space where the move it middleware exploits have become dramatically impacting to organizations. If we can empower executives to pose their own scenarios when these events come out, imagine if you would, if you had an interface to ask a generative AI system to say, where do I have exposures in my payment, credit, debit, or insurance functions of my firm based on this middleware uh, exploit that's come out via MoveIt? Now, traditionally how this would happen is a, an executive would talk to their direct reports to locate a development resource that can build them a custom report that indicates all of the attributes that they're looking for to visualize and get a report on. And that's how we've done data reporting for decades. But with generative AI, I feel that building that inference model and the inherent data behind the environment of an organization, we no longer have to ask a developer to build those things on the fly and then modify them as the request changes. We can simply provide a conversational interface to do that scenario analysis run it through the inference model and come back with the likely or expected results that we see. Like a chatbot? Like a chatbot, okay. but contextualized okay. for the organization and the applications and the lines of business. Interesting. We know that this is all possible and we're really excited to see as this grows its use case within the market. Okay, so that's really fascinating. And in terms of regulatory components, how does that help? Because I know 
you know, regulations are in place not only to be adhered to, but it's also supposed to try to prevent some of those more risk averted uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. So how does this um, risk tech dot AI help with those cases as well for those in the regulatory space? Right. So this is really interesting because regulations are another avenue that's really causing a lot of stress when it comes to compliance around cybersecurity. I mean, you've seen, obviously, in the U.S. last year, there was an executive order from President Biden about various aspects of cybersecurity that the public sector needs to adopt. And we're going to see a ripple effect. And it's not just this, you know, obviously regulations around data privacy with upcoming regulations with DORA. We've seen it in GDPR. We've seen it with CCPA and changes to CCPA over time. I think the, the key takeaway here is that the regulators are always going to be an increasing presence in terms of driving up the overall expectation and maturity that's needed across the board to ensure uh, a more resilient and safe technology operation right. in light of cybersecurity incidents. Now, obviously, you know, you can scale linearly. If we looked at the old fashioned way of doing risk assessment, and as I mentioned before, is very manual, where we send questionnaires and we ask application owners to identify or self identify risks, this obviously doesn't scale well, right? And the increase in regulation would only have a linear effect on approaches like that, which is why we know that we have to move to data driven risk assessment. To be honest, data-driven approaches have been used for financial risk for over a decade, right? And we expect that same level of maturity and approach to be done for IT risk and governance. And that is exactly the trend that we see and that we help our clients with and that our accelerator addresses. The ability to do an assessment in microseconds, having the real-time data in an analytic platform already, where both predictive AI or generative AI techniques can be used alongside very traditional relationship-driven analytics to derive outcomes and identify pockets of risk and necessary remediation really shortens the cycle of how we address and manage risk. It allows us to prove to our regulators, our auditors, and internal audit that we have a regularly recurring process for identifying, detecting, protecting, responding, and recovering to. There are those know, words again. Exactly. I use them a lot. Right. Um, it's the cornerstone of all risk management practices in IT. Effectively, the types of tools that we're looking to build today will help kind of break the cycle of linear effort being placed on the organization, the risk organizations, and get them into a more modern operating paradigm that we like to call digital governance. Awesome. And that can apply. I've seen in real time that each regulatory aspect can be curated based on geography or sector, yes. uh, which is really quite extensive. Now, the closing question I have is to understand what's coming. Yeah. What future trends can we talk with our clients, executives, about the IT risk and cybersecurity areas, some global examples to create a less risky mm. operating rhythm? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of future trends, threat modeling is the place where a lot of people want to get to, whether it be testing and training exercises, which a lot of a lot of firms have very, I guess, what I would call immature ways of doing threat modeling as tabletop exercises, as scenario that they build, but verbally. That's kind of what a tabletop exercise is. It's the verbalizing of a Monte Carlo type situation where you play the what if game and you start to litmus test where your weaknesses are. And those are a great way for organizations to get started. It's the only real tools that they have that have been really available to them, you know, if you look at the last decade. So again, I think leveraging the power of generative AI and really its roots in some of its predecessors, like Dungeon AI, for example. It was very much born on that role-playing aspect of AI and how that linguistic dialogue is unfolded. And it's also one of the reasons why it has such good mastery of the human language. So being able to transform some of those scenarios into verbalized scenarios where you're now prompting, you're setting a scene with the AI tool. And the AI tool 
is digesting the scene that you've given it and the boundaries of which to evaluate and using the environment's data around the whole risk management plane to now give you the outcomes or likely outcomes based on the training and the inference model that has been built around assets, software, people, locations, branches, perimeters, cloud connections, public internet connections. None of us as a human can talk about those things so quickly and context switch and be so complete in our view. We just have that limitation as humans, but AI can parse through those things in microseconds and start to give us causality across those things. So I'm really looking forward to how threat modeling is used there to up the game in back testing and doing the scenario red teaming of where weaknesses might be or where a current event might have a potential impact and being able to apply the context of that current event to your environment in seconds as opposed to going and telling developers to build you reports that you think you just have a hunch might be areas of exposure. So I think that's what we should look forward to in the future. Sounds good. I would love to borrow that crystal ball of yours. <laughs> um, okay, well, Chris, thank you so much for all of your expertise, your advice, and also your future prediction and where we should keep our eyes set forward to. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to having you back. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Cinecron State of Tech podcast. Don't forget to like and share this episode and subscribe to stay up to date on all of the latest and innovative technologies savvy businesses need to know about. To learn more about Cinecron, head to our website at www.cinecron.com. Stay tuned.